the microphone that I'm speaking into right now fulfills the purpose of its existence by projecting my voice so that everybody here could hear me. The shoes on our feet fulfill the purpose for their existence by giving comfort to our feet when we walk or when we run. We, creatures and children of God, created in the image and likeness of God, we too have a purpose for our existence. And we can find that purpose in the Baltimore Catechism when it says, God made me to know him, to love him, and to serve him in this world, and to be happy with him forever in heaven. This is the number one top priority goal for our immortal soul as we live here in this temporary short life on earth. Jesus Christ himself taught in the Gospel of Matthew, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and everything else will be added unto it. And this principle can be directly connected and related to our gospel reading today, which is the parable of the unfaithful yet prudent steward. Just to recap this parable here, and I will now just paraphrase it, we see that there was a steward who squandered his master's property. And when the master discovered this, the master essentially says to the steward, to use street language, I am going to fire you. And so what does the steward do? The steward meets up with his master's debtors and he reduces their debt. He does this to become friends with this, these people so that when the steward gets fired and loses his job, these new friends of his will welcome him into their home so that he can live comfortably, that is, that he could have a house to live in. Now, what the steward did, objectively speaking, was immoral. We should not imitate this insofar as he was dishonest. However, the master still commended the steward for his worldly wisdom and prudence in securing his future. He commended him for investing his time, efforts, and labor in securing his temporal welfare here on earth, specifically that he could live comfortably in living in a house. So the spiritual connotation that we could take from this parable here is that if we, who live in the world, work laboriously and invest our zeal, time, and efforts and energy in securing our temporal welfare here on earth to live comfortably and to even have a house to live in, how much more so are we to invest that same work, labor, time, energies in securing our spiritual welfare, in securing our spiritual future, specifically and most importantly, that we may be welcomed into the eternal house that is the house of God, the kingdom of heaven, which is the number one top priority for our immortal soul. This is why Jesus Christ said in the gospel today, for the children of this world are more prudent in dealing with their own generation than are the children of light. The children of light can be interpreted as people who live a spiritual life. Or how about that other parable found in the Gospel of Luke that drives this point home even further and can even be connected with Jesus' teaching in our Gospel today? As he said, you cannot serve both God and mammon, which essentially refers to money. It's the account of the rich fool 
we recall the rich fool, he tore down all of his barns and he built larger ones. One can imagine how much he had to invest his time, effort, and labor in building these new big barns. And he stores his goods in these barns and he says to himself, take life easy, eat, drink, and be merry. In other words, after zealously investing his time and energy in building these barns and storing his goods to secure his earthly happiness, so to speak, he adds laziness to it, yet he doesn't lift a finger to secure his spiritual welfare. And the scripture states that God says to him, you fool, this very night, your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? This is how it will be with whoever stores up things for themselves, but is not rich towards God. Saint Jose Maria Scriva spoke about this very principle regarding the zeal that people have here for earthly matters in comparison with the zeal for ensuring our spiritual welfare. He once said, what zeal people put in their earthly affairs, dreaming of honors, striving for riches, bent on sensuality. When you and I put that same zeal into the affairs of our souls, we will have a living and operative faith and there will be no obstacle that we cannot overcome in our apostolic undertakings. So now all this being said, perhaps I could provide some concrete examples of things we may see in our everyday life and in this world and compare them to how we could spiritually invest in our spiritual welfare. I'm sure you've all heard of Black Friday before. It is the biggest shopping day of the year. It's called Black Friday because uh, the companies and stores, they're always in the black, meaning they always earn profit that day. They're never in the red, meaning they don't they're never in debt that day. So on that day, there are people who wait in line for hours. Some people even bend over backwards in camping out overnight so that these people who are waiting in line can be the first people to get into the stores in the morning so that they could acquire material goods. Now, uh, I don't want to be misunderstood here, the desire to give that special gift to a loved one as an expression of love is something commendable in and of itself. I do not want to downplay that whatsoever. But the point being here is that if someone is willing to make such a sacrifice to bend over backwards to invest their time and energies to do such a thing, then how much more so should a person invest their time, energies, and efforts to, for example, drive to the church on the weekend and to wait in line to go to confession for the good of their immortal soul, which is directly connected to the number one top priority, which is entering into the kingdom of heaven, especially if somebody falls into mortal sin and out of the grace of God's sanctifying grace. Just something for us to think about. Here's another example. I'm just going to pick on myself here. When I was younger, I used to eat, drink, and sleep basketball. And I used to invest time and effort in doing research on uh, professional basketball players' statistics and even their own personal lives. And uh, I would be fixated hours of watching basketball games throughout the week. Yet, when it came to attending Mass on Sunday, uh, for me, it was the longest hour of the week. 
Why? Because I never invested any time or energy in knowing about the holy sacrifice of the mass. I didn't know that the divine lamb, his sacrifice on the cross on Calvary for our salvation is being perpetuated in an unbloody manner. And according to the saints, there are countless angels right next to us adoring our sacred Lord at the time of consecration. I was missing the bus. I wasn't investing my energies in what was the most important thing here. Just to stay on this topic regarding mass, how about when people in this world are invited to a formal banquet or a wedding? What do people do? They put on their best attire. Men put on their best suits. Women put on their best dresses. They wear their finest jewelry. Well, if people are willing to go all out in regards to an earthly banquet, well, how much more so should a person do that in regards to the eternal banquet? That is, the divine lamb, Jesus Christ, the beloved bridegroom, is being wedded, so to speak, to his spiritual spouse, the church, and laying down his life for the church and sacrifice at the altar. Now again, I don't want to be misunderstood here. I'm not saying that we're obliged to be wearing tuxedos or our finest jewelry and masks, but the principle is there. Are, giving, are we giving what is due in preparation and properly disposing ourselves for the floodgates of grace being open, the graces of God flowing from the altar at this Eucharistic table? Again, something to seriously think about. Or how about for all you athletes here, including myself, we have to devote much time and effort and discipline in our training in hope of coming out victorious in the game. And St. Paul speaks about this in the sacred scriptures when he says, everyone who competes Pete's in the games goes into strict training. They do this to get a crown that will not last. But we do it to get a crown that will last forever. And so one of the most powerful ways in which we could invest in our spiritual welfare for the good of our immortal soul is the practice of frequent confession. It can never be overemphasized. In confession, it is a meeting with our Lord Jesus Christ himself through the minister of priesthood. And when the absolution is given, the merits of Christ's redeeming blood, one on the cross for us, flow through the absolution and our immortal soul is washed away clean from all of our sins and we are reconciled with the divine God, man of mercy. Just to compare confession with uh, the account of our gospel today, uh, we recall that of the debtors of the master, um, their debt was reduced. Um, it wasn't completely covered completely. <laughs> well, in confession, the debt of our sins is not just reduced, it is completely covered, washed away completely. Of course, we still need to do penance and uh, repair the damage that was created by our sins by works of charity and these types of devotions that we have here on earth. But again, the guilt of sin, all washed away clean. Um, putting stock that is in investing in confession, we will always win from putting in stock in this great sacrament of the church. And the saints themselves knew and understood the power of confession even within the context of investing, that is putting our efforts and energies into putting everything into the spiritual welfare of our souls. St. Leonard of Port Morris once said, poor souls, how can you run so hastily to hell? Either you understand what it means to be saved and to be damned for all eternity, or you do not. If you understand, and in spite of that, you do not decide to change your life today, make a good confession, 
and trample upon the world. In a word, make your every effort to be counted among the little number of those who are saved. I say that you do not have the faith. To be saved for all eternity, to be damned for all eternity, and to not make your every effort to avoid the one and to make sure of the other is inconceivable. So my dear brothers and sisters in Christ, by the grace of God, may we have zeal in investing in our spiritual welfare for our spiritual future in hope of being welcomed into the house of God, the kingdom of heaven, and to be faithful to the word of God, the scriptures, as St. Paul once said to the letter to the Philippians, yes, everything else is worthless when compared with the infinite value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I have discarded everything else, counting it all as garbage so that I could gain Christ. And Psalm 27 says, one thing I ask of the Lord, this only do I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. God bless you.